Orthodox Presbyterian Church for our morning service in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just a few announcements. A Bible study will be meeting this Wednesday, 7 p.m., to study Isaiah 3, verse 16, through chapter 4, verse 1. And Gems will meet this Thursday at 3.30. We will have a Good Friday service, funnily enough, on Friday. Um, that will be at 7 o'clock, and we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper at that service. And also we will have uh, refreshments following that service. Sunday school class will not meet next uh, week, because that is Easter Sunday morning. Also have a request for disaster relief from Reformed Mission Services, and you can read about that in the bulletin. Uh, talk to Don or Karen for more information. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of the living God with a time of silent prayer. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. I will give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be present among us this morning. Please turn with me to number hymn number 235, All Glory, Laud, and Honor, 235.
Jesus Christ since we hope this Good Friday to celebrate the Blessed Sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we are called to prepare our hearts by rightly examining ourselves. For the Apostle Paul has written, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. Let all of us then, examine our lives, and considering our own sin and the wrath of God on it, be sure that we humble ourselves in repentance before God. Let us examine our hearts to be sure that we trust in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation, and that we believe our sins are forgiven wholly by grace for the sake of our Lord's sacrifice on the cross. Let us examine our consciences to be sure that we resolve to live in faith and obedience before our Lord, and in love and peace with our neighbors. God will surely receive at the table of his Son all who truly repent of their sins, believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, and desire to do his will. All those, however, who do not repent, who do not put their trust in the Lord Jesus, and who have no desire to lead a godly life, are warned according to the command of God to keep themselves from the Holy Sacrament. If we are living in disobedience to Christ and in enmity with our neighbors, we must repent of our sin and reconcile ourselves to our neighbors before we come to the Lord's table. For if we partake of the sacrament in unbelief and willful disobedience, we eat and drink judgment to ourselves. This solemn warning is not designed, however, to discourage penitent sinners from coming to the Holy Sacrament. We do not come to the supper as though we were righteous in ourselves, but rather to testify that we are sinners and that we look to Jesus Christ for our salvation. Although we do not have perfect faith, and do not serve and love God with all our hearts, and though we do not love our neighbors as we ought, we are confident that the Savior accepts us at his table when we come in humble faith with sorrow for our sins, and with a will to follow him as he commands. And since it is necessary for us to come to the sacrament in good conscience, we urge any who lack this confidence to seek from the minister or any elder of this church such counsel as may quiet their consciences or lead to the conversion of their lives. Please turn with me to hymn number 613. Give thanks unto the Lord Jehovah, number 613.
Our expository reading for the morning is 1 Chronicles chapter 2, which you can find on page 394. This chapter we continue the genealogical prologue of First Chronicles. Every time you see a name that has a story with it, you're supposed to remember that whole history that goes along with it. In particular, we see the genealogy of David highlighted uh, and the tribe of Judah. If you remember from Genesis 49, Judah was given preeminence over the three older sons of Jacob because of various sins the older sons had committed. And the Lord had promised that the Messiah King would come from the line of Judah and thereafter David, we know from 2 Samuel 7. So we can also see, though, some interesting points about worship. Uh, Chronicles was written, by the way, after the exile. Kings was written during the exile. So Kings asks the question, how did it come to this? How did we get into this mess? Chronicles asks a question, are we still the people of God at all? So Chronicles emphasizes continuity between pre- and post-exile communities of God. Kings emphasizes the sin and the idolatry. Now, Chronicles mentions some sins and idolatries, but you'll find that uh, Chronicles' treatment of David and Solomon in particular uh, does not have some of the major sins listed in Kings. So here we can see also the continuity in worship because uh, Batsal Ael, who we're actually going to hear about tonight as the main architect of the tabernacle and its furnishings, is mentioned here in the genealogy alongside David's genealogy. And that is making a theological point that the worship of God after the exile will be in continuity with the worship of the people of God before the exile. And all of this genealogy sets up actually an expectation of a Messiah to come from the line of David. This genealogy has points to make, theological points to make. We don't want to miss those in all the names. So this is the word of our God, 1 Chronicles 2. These are the sons of Israel, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Joseph, Benjamin, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The sons of Judah, Er, Onan, and Shelah. These three, Batshua, the Canaanite, bore to him. Now Er, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death. His daughter-in-law, Tamar, also bore him Perez and Zerah. Judah had five sons in all. The sons of Perez, Chetzron, and Hamul. The sons of Zerah, Zimri, Ethan, Heman, Kalkol, and Dara, five in all. The sons of Carmi, Achan, the troubler of Israel, who broke faith in the matter of the devoted things. And Ethan's son was Azariah. The sons of Chetzron that were born to him, Yerachmael, Ram, and Kelubai. Ram fathered Aminadav, and Aminadav fathered Nachshon, prince of the sons of Judah. Nachshon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse. Jesse fathered Eliav, his firstborn, Avinadav, the second, Shimeah, the third, Nathanael, the fourth, Radai, the fifth, Otzim, the sixth, David, the seventh. And their sisters were Tzeruiah and Abigail. The sons of Tzeruiah, Abishai, Joab, and Asahel, three. Abigail bore Amasah, and the father of Amasah was yet there, the Ishmaelite. Caleb, the son of Hezron, fathered children by his wife, Azubah, and by Yeriot. And these were her sons, Yesher, Shobab, and Ardon. When Azubah died, Caleb married Ephrath, who bore him Hur. Hur fathered Uri, and Uri fathered Betzal Ael. Afterward, Hezron went in to the daughter of Machir, the father of Gilead, whom he married when he was 60 years old. She bore him Seguv. And Seguv fathered Yair, who had 23 cities in the land of Gilead. But Geshur and Aram took from them Havot, Yair, Kanat, and its villages, 60 towns. All these were descendants of Machir, the father of Gilead. After the death of Hetzron, Caleb went in to Ephratah, the wife of Hetzron, his father, and she bore him Ashpur, the father of Tekoa. 
The sons of Yerach Ba'el, the firstborn of Hezron, Ram his firstborn, Buna, Oren, Otsim, and Ahiyah. Yerach Ba'el also had another wife whose name was Atara. She was the mother of Onam. The sons of Ram, the firstborn of Yerach Ba'el, Ma'atz, Yamin, and Eker. The sons of Onam, Shammai, and Yada. The sons of Shammai, Nadav, and Avishur. The name of Avishur's wife was Avihail, and she bore him Achban and Molid. The sons of Nadav, Seled, and Apayim. And Seled died childless. The sons of Apayim, Ishi. The son of Ishi, Sheshan. The son of Sheshan, Achlai. The sons of Yada, Shammai's brother, Yeter and Jonathan. And Yeter died childless. The sons of Jonathan, Panet and Zaza. These were the descendants of Yerach Ma'el. Now Sheshan had no sons, only daughters. But Sheshan had an Egyptian slave whose name was Yarha. So Sheshan gave his daughter in marriage to Yarha, his slave, and she bore him Atai. Atai fathered Nathan, Nathan fathered Zavad. Zavad fathered Eflal, and Eflal fathered Obed. Obed fathered Yehu, and Yehu fathered Azariah. Azariah fathered Chaledz, and Chaledz fathered Eliasa. Eliasa fathered Sismai, and Sismai fathered Shalom. Shalom fathered Yakamya, and Yakamya fathered Elishama. The sons of Caleb, the firstborn of Yerach Ma'el, Maresha is firstborn, who fathered Zif. The son of Maresha, Hebron. The son of, uh, sons of Hebron, Korah, Tapuah, Rechem, and Shema. Shema fathered Raham, the father of Yor Ke'am, and Rechem fathered Shammai. The son of Shammai, Ma'on, and Ma'on fathered Beitzur. Epha also, Caleb's concubine, bore Haran, Motza, and Gazez. The Haran fathered Gazez. The sons of Yachdai, Regen, Yotam, Geshan, Pelet, Epha, and Sha'af. Ma'aka, Caleb's concubine, bore Sheber and Tirhana. She also bore Sha'af, the father of Madmana, Shava, the father of Machbena, and the father of Gibeah. And the daughter of Caleb was Aksa. These were the descendants of Caleb. The sons of Hur, the firstborn of Ephrata, Shoval, the father of Kiryat Yarim, Salma, the father of Bethlehem, and Haref, the father of Beit Gader. Shoval, the father of Kiryat Yarim, had other sons, Haroe, half of the Menuchot, and the clans of Kiryat Yarim, the Ithrites, the Puthites, the Shumathites, and the Mishraites. From these came the Zorathites and the Eshtaolites. The sons of Salma, Bethlehem, the Netophathites, Atrot Beit Yoav, and half of the Menachathites, the Zorites. The clans also of the scribes who lived at Jabez, the Tirathites, the Shemaethites, and the Sukathites. These are the Kenites who came from Hamat, the father of the house of Rechav. Let us come before our God in prayer. <coughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one true, eternal, unchangeable, all-powerful God, we bless you for who you are. We bless you for all your mighty attributes, your holiness, your justice, your goodness, your truth, your eternal nature, which is unchangeable. We thank you that you are present everywhere and praise you that you see all things, and you are both just and merciful. We thank you that in the fullness of time you sent your Son, born under the law, born to live the perfect life of the law keeper, born to relive Israel's story only faithfully. We thank you, Father, that Jesus is true Israel. He embodies true Israel in his person, he is the seed of Abraham, through whom all the nations of the world should be blessed. We thank you, Father, that he came to earth in order to establish a spiritual kingdom, one that is not of this world, that is not of the kingdom of Satan, and yet robs Satan's kingdom of its members. We thank you, Father, that we have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light by your grace and favor. We thank you, Father, that our Lord Jesus Christ came into Jerusalem 
in his final week to suffer and to die and to be in the tomb and to rise from the dead and thus be declared the Son of God in power by the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, and we praise you that he is the one who is blessed to come in the name of the Lord. We thank you that he is the one to whom palm branches were put in the road and that the lips of children praised him. We thank you that his entrance was indeed a triumph and we thank you so much, Father, that it was not the triumph expected, a mere political triumph over Rome. We thank you, Father, that it was so much more than that. A triumph over Satan, a triumph over sin and death itself that Jesus came to Jerusalem to accomplish. We thank you, Father, for the gifts that Jesus Christ, our Lord and King, has bestowed upon his church because he is triumphant and is at the right hand of you, the Father, and that the Holy Spirit is therefore poured out upon the church so that we can have the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. We thank you and praise you and ask that you will make these gifts and fruit to mature in our lives so that we may follow your paths, that we may do what you have commanded, that we may show our gratitude for salvation, that we may love the lost, and that we may tell them about the marvelous work of Jesus Christ that puts an end to all sacrifice, that puts an end to all ceremony, that institutes a new way to worship you, a way characterized by spirit and truth. We pray that we might do that today, that our hearts and minds will be yours, that we belong to you, body and soul, we thank you, Father, for this message that the Church Universal proclaims. We pray, Father, wherever it is clear and true to your word, that the hearts and minds of those who listen will be open to it. We pray, Father, wherever it is diminished, distorted, or an outright lie, that you would close the hearts of those who hear. And, Father, that you would change that message to the truth. We pray, Father, for our efforts here in this church to reach out to our community. We pray that you will bless them and increase those opportunities. That we may invite our friends and neighbors and tell them about Jesus, not worrying about the consequences, but being bold in love. We pray, Father, for those who cannot be with us today, for those who are ill, for those who are mourning, for those who are downcast in spirit, whatever else they might need as spiritual comfort from you, that you would bestow it upon them graciously and abundantly. And we pray for all our members, Father, that we will grow in the grace and knowledge of you and your word. We pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to stand and turn with me to hymn number 236, When His Salvation Bringing, hymn number 236.
Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you to see who Jesus is in the pages of Scripture, we pray that you will give us clear minds and open hearts, that your Holy Spirit will illumine the way for us, that we too will see what Jesus is really doing and who he really is. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11 in the Church Bible. That's Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. This is God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. The wise professor in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe had a very entertaining discussion with Peter and Susan about whether Lucy was telling the truth about the wardrobe. He says, there's only three possibilities. Lucy is either lying, or she is crazy, or she is telling the truth. They know that Lucy is a very truthful girl, and it's obvious from talking to Lucy and looking at her as she behaves that she is not crazy, therefore she must be telling the truth. C.S. Lewis uses this scene as an allegory for how people talk about Jesus. There are famously three possibilities regarding Jesus' claims about himself to be God. Jesus is either lying, or he's crazy, or he's telling the truth. If Jesus is lying about his own status, then he is the greatest blasphemer of all time. And therefore, he cannot be a mere great moral teacher. Lewis says in another work, he cannot be a mere great moral teacher. He did not leave that option open to us. It is obvious that Jesus at least believed his own words. Was he simply mistaken? As some atheists will say today. If he was mistaken about his claims, then why would his disciples be willing to die for what they knew was a lie? That makes no sense. And if Jesus is crazy, he can't be a great moral teacher either. It's obvious then that when one examines Jesus' words that are not claims to deity, it becomes obvious Jesus is not crazy, but rather has a most keen mind and penetrating insight into human character. The only option that makes sense is that Jesus is telling the truth. We might ask the question, does Jesus claim to be God, though? A lot of people think that he doesn't make that claim. We only have to go to John 8 for the clearest refutation of that idea. Jesus is having his debates with the Pharisees and the Jews. He's talking about who his father is and who the father of the Israelites is. 
The Israelites say that we have Abraham for our father. Jesus says if, you, if Abraham was your father, you would do the works of Abraham. But then he says, before Abraham was, I am. That is a claim to be the God of the burning bush. It is a claim to deity, which the Jews very clearly understood as a claim to deity, because they took up stones to stone him. And Jesus didn't correct them and say, oh no, you've got it wrong. He knew they understood him correctly, even though they didn't believe that he was God. They understood he made a claim to deity. Well, Jesus is coming into the city for his last week of life on earth before the crucifixion. Jesus is approaching the city of Jerusalem from the northeast. Mount of Olives is on the east side of Jerusalem, and Beit Fage is on the north side. Matthew is concerned to tell us about how everything Jesus does is a fulfillment of prophecy. And here we can see that even the direction of Jesus' entrance is a fulfillment of prophecy, even though Matthew does not explicitly record it. But Ezekiel says this in chapter 11, And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city. It was from the east that Ezekiel looked for hope. And that echo is here in Matthew 21. That's where Jesus comes from. Comes from the east. That's connected, of course, to entering the temple from the east. The, the, the entrance to the temple is always on the east. The entrance to the tabernacle is on the east. The entrance to the Garden of Eden is on the east. Reclaiming what humanity was supposed to have in the beginning means coming from the east. And that's exactly what Jesus does. Jesus demonstrates here that he knows all things, tells two of his disciples to fetch his royal means of transport, a donkey. We might think that's rather silly for royalty. But then when Matthew quotes Zechariah, we see the donkey was not seen by Israel as a mean and lowly animal. It was, in fact, a king's animal. It was a purebred donkey, which was usually a sign of wealth in the first century. Now, the other gospel accounts mention only one animal, and Matthew tells us of two. And the reason for that in Matthew is that the colt would need its mother if it was going to remain calm through all of the exciting times that were just around the corner. The other accounts merely do not mention the colt, the colt's mother. And another reason Matthew mentions the mother of the colt is that the prophecy said in Zechariah that the colt would be the foal of a beast of burden. So Matthew ensures us that we know that Jesus rode on the colt and not on the mother as additional proof of the fulfillment of prophecy. The other gospel accounts tell us this colt had never been ridden before. Jesus knew where this animal was without actually going there to see. And so he does know all things. Jesus foresees a possible problem in verse 3. The disciples might be thinking that someone would stop them. Wouldn't this action seem like stealing? What, what if the colt's owner tries to stop them? What would they say in reply? Jesus tells them not to worry, but to say that the Lord has need of it. Jesus is invoking here the ancient right of kings to the property of their subjects temporarily. If the king was in need, he had the right to use the property of a subject without asking permission from that person. Jesus knew what he was doing here. He was, in fact, portraying himself as a king. He's acting like the king he, in fact, is. A king can use the property of his subjects. He knew that the owner of the cult would agree and would raise no objections because God had ordained that it should happen in that way. In Mark and Luke, we learn that people, some people did, in fact, ask that question of why they were taking 
the dog came, but sure enough, after the disciples said what Jesus had told them to say, the people let them take the donkey. Well, if Jesus is acting like the king he is, then we must ask ourselves, what sort of king is this Jesus? Though the donkey may be part of the fulfillment of prophecy, we could, in fact, imagine a more majestic entrance into Jerusalem. Picture Jesus riding on a, a majestic war horse, for example, in full armor with a herald riding before him, telling people the deeds of the king. We can imagine a huge armed guard with trumpets and standards going before and shouting out the command to bend the knee. But Jesus does ride into Jerusalem in a humble way. He rides on a beast of burden. That's not what a conquering king would choose. So Matthew is telling us that this entrance into Jerusalem is not a political move. The people may have thought so when they showered palm leaves and branches on the road and shouted their hosannas in his honor. But they had the wrong idea, as Matthew very clearly tells us. Jesus was coming to Jerusalem to meet his death, and his victory did not come until Easter. He did not come as a conquering king in the way the Jews were thinking because his kingdom is not of this world. It's a heavenly kingdom. The people got it wrong, as many people get it wrong today. They thought Jesus and God exist merely to serve their physical interests. They thought that their their main connection with God is that God will take care of all of their problems. That, that God exists to serve them. In the first century, their main problem is Rome, isn't it? They thought their main problem was Rome. And the fact that they thought that that was their main problem means that they were inevitably going to misinterpret what Christ came to do. Misinterpreting what Christ came to do means that they would also misinterpret who Jesus is. What did they think? What was the nature of their misinterpretation? Well, to understand what the people were thinking, we have to rewind the tape of history about 200 years. The time is 175 B.C. The time between the Old and New Testament, we call it the intertestamental period. A man named Antiochus Epiphanes was ruler over Judah. He was a descendant of Alexander the Great and was therefore a Macedonian, a Gentile. He hated the Jews and he wanted to keep them under his thumb. So he thought he would completely cut off all worship in the temple by sacrificing a pig on the altar. That's an unclean animal. And it made the temple at least temporarily unusable for the Jews. This is the story told in the second book of Maccabees. Now Judas Maccabeus eventually roused the whole countryside. They drove out Antiochus Epiphanes and cleansed the temple. The people rejoiced greatly, and when Judas entered Jerusalem, the entire city was there. They laid down palm branches on the road. They sang psalms to the Lord, especially Psalm 118, which we've sung today and used as our call to worship. And they praised the Lord that he had given them a redeemer from the hand of Antiochus Epiphanes in the person of Judas Maccabeus. And Judas goes and cleanses the temple. When Judas cleansed the temple, the entire city rededicated the temple. And that celebration is the origin of the Jewish celebration, Hanukkah. And Jesus, as well as the Jews of that time, knew this tradition like we know our American history. Or maybe like we don't know our American history in some cases. But it is no accident that the very next thing Jesus does after he enters into Jerusalem is that he goes and cleanses the temple. So in some ways, Jesus did do what Judas Maccabeus did. And so the people thought Jesus was going to do to the Romans what Judas Maccabeus did to Antiochus Epiphanes. 
They were looking for that political Savior and Messiah. But Jesus was not what they were looking for. In less than a week, the very same people who were shouting their hosannas would be shouting out, Crucify Him! They should have been able to get their first hint that Jesus wasn't who they thought He was when they saw that Jesus cleansed the temple of Jews, not foreigners, because in this case it was the Jews who were defiling the temple, not Gentiles like Antiochus Epiphanes. The Jews were somewhat slow to pick up on this, but eventually they did. And when they finally understood what Jesus was really about, they were furious. He's not coming to free us from the Romans? What kind of a Messiah is that? But Jesus didn't come to do that. He was coming to free them from themselves, from their corrupted sin nature, from sin itself, and not just them, but people from every tribe and language on earth. The majority of Jews, tragically, rejected Jesus as the majority of them still do to this day, all because they have incorrect ideas and expectations about who Jesus is and what he came to do. We have incorrect ideas today. Lots of people who like Jesus or like the idea of Jesus think of him as a sort of insurance policy. Jesus is an add-on to our lives. He's our last resource, and when all of our other resources, especially those inside ourselves, are come to an end, then we can rely on Jesus to take up the slack, right? He's a security blanket. He's this soft, cuddly little teddy bear of a toy. Or maybe he is just a mere good moral teacher like Gandhi or the Dalai Lama. And what people think like that is that he couldn't possibly be both God and man in one person. Rather, they think he's merely human. Some people think of him as a crutch. Some people might be attracted to the sensational views like that of the Da Vinci Code or the supposed discovery of Jesus' tomb and body, which is false. No, it is better to rely on what Scripture says about Jesus, that he is God, that he is man, that he is one person, that he did come to save people from their sin, and that he has to be fully God and fully man to do that. He has to be fully man, because otherwise he would not be a substitute for other human beings. He couldn't take our place. And if he wasn't God, there's no way he could bear the full penalty of sin for billions of people. We're tempted to think of Jesus as an add-on to our lives, there to get us out of trouble. We need to rethink our conception of Jesus. Because he came not to save us from every little trouble that comes our way. These troubles often make us grow, and they're often God's plan for us. He came to save us from the greatest problem of all, sin and death. Now, of course, Jesus can deliver us from these other difficulties at times, and even small difficulties. He's not someone who's going to ignore those things. But when, when these troubles come, we tend to think of Jesus as a last resort, or we tend to blame him. We must turn to Jesus first, middle, and last. He's not our last resort. He's the only resort. And that that resort will be enough to tell us in times of trouble that God has something for us in that trouble. He has something positive for us. He has something that will help us to grow. 
Our every breath is a gift from God. We're utterly dependent on God for everything in life. Our everyday lives, our eternal destiny, it is all dependent on Him. So we cry out, Hosanna to the Son of David, and praise Jesus for the true kingdom He brings, for being the true King of kings and Lord of lords that He is. That He brings the true spiritual kingdom that frees us from our true enemy, sin and death. So it is a triumphal entrance into Jerusalem after all. Even if it's not the same triumph that the people there expected it to be, it is in fact a far greater triumph. Praise Jesus for his triumph over the great deceiver, Satan. Praise him for spilling his blood in our place. Praise him for being a much greater king than any political kingdom could possibly make him. Praise Him for being Lord of heaven and earth. Praise Him for inaugurating this kingdom that will never end. Praise Him with great praise. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for who You are, not who we imagine You to be, but who You actually are. Forgive us when our conception of You does not match reality. We ask that You will correct any misimpressions we might have of who Jesus is and what he came to do. We thank you, Father, that you consider, and it is in your mind, all the troubles we face. We thank you that you have a good purpose for them when we do face them. We thank you that ultimately we will be delivered out of them all, though it may not be in this life. We pray, Father, that you will help us to understand what Jesus really came to do so that we will praise him with great praise. For it is in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. We serve with me to hymn number 237. We'll stand and sing, Ride on, ride on in majesty. 237.
mission that he accomplished and gave us the power to proclaim as finished. We pray, Father, that these tithes and offerings will proclaim your greatness and goodness, your accomplished work in Christ. Bless them and expand them in your kingdom for your glory and honor alone. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. <laughs> 